Welcome everyone to the Adversity to Advantage podcast. I am extremely excited to have been introduced to this wonderful human, uh, Space Holmes Lewis. Uh, he's got his perfect uh, hoodie on that highlights the, the company he is CEO of, Mentivity, which I wanna hear all about. You're an activist, a keynote speaker. I know you've done coaching, you've worked with young people. Tell us just a little bit about what you do. Um, well, it's a lot. Now you said it, you've listened. It is, isn't it? <laughs> it's like a lot to me. But um, yeah, I mean, I've been working with young people since the age of 16. And as a young person myself, started off coaching and then realized I could build you know, good rapport with young people. So I've been doing you know, coaching for the last 21 years of my life, which is a long time now, I say. Goodness. Uh, I know. <laughs> um, I've been working in education for about 15 years as a professional, as a started off as a teaching assistant and just supporting young people and as a mentor, which you know, comes and is part and parcel of the role. Um, the keynote speaking has come um, later on after finishing university and kind of gaining the confidence by, by delivering seminars. Um, and now an activist, you know, just speaking up for my community and my people really, and just kind of highlighting oppression, inequality and racism. So that's, you know, me in a nutshell. Um, and when we spoke briefly on the phone, well, it wasn't actually that brief in the end because I thought I felt so aligned with some of the challenges that you faced and some of your story. Um, and even though it's not the same story, just that feeling of adversity and challenge being the thing in a way that's trained us uh, for, for who we are now and the impact uh, we're both trying to make in different ways. Um, so before we dive into this sort of mental health topic as far as work and, and just how it's affected your personal life, I'm curious about this one thing. What has been the best piece of advice that you have received when it, when it comes to your work or career? Have you had a piece of advice that has just pushed you on when it came to that? Yeah, um, that's a great question. That's a really great question because I've had some really great mentors and people support me throughout my career. But there's one person in particular, uh, a guy called Abdullah Ben Kamar, who was my coach and introduced me to coaching. And he just said, always persevere. Um, because he's been my coach since I was 14 and been someone in my life. And he's seen the, the adversity I've had to overcome. And he's always said, say, just always persevere. Just the same way you do on the football pitch. Even when your, your, your team's losing, you still have belief that your team's going to come back and win. And you're always persevering on the pitch. So you make sure that you do this off the pitch. So that's something I've always, you know, really tried to do is always persevere no matter what. I love that because that's so relevant for now where, where people are like, you know, oh, times are hard and everything's difficult. But I love that analogy of like your, your team's losing. Like it's a, it's a bad day. It is not going well. <laughs> but you have to have that core belief in your heart um, that, that you could still win. It's not like, oh, I'm just going to get through the game. It's like I could turn it around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so having that that level of, of perseverance, I love it. Now, has there been anything that you've had to unlearn when it comes to work? So maybe habits or mindsets or, or, or the type of work ethic you had um, that you actually had to unlearn in order to be successful like you are now. Yeah, I, I think one of the major things, and it's going to be weird me saying it because of the work that I do, but it's, it's being more empathetic and really just understanding where people are coming from. I'm pretty much from a young age been a, a quite a judgmental person of, of people and maybe what they do and I think that kind of stems from my upbringing in terms of being someone from the Caribbean and that's how we our culture is we're quite judgmental and I, I realized that when my my grand came first came over to England and she was watching tv with her, her sister and they were, they were in their 70s and everything that came on the tv was judging this judging that and I was like oh this is where it comes from and that's something which I've been you know really working on myself in terms of not judging a book by its cover especially with young people just understanding that they have a separate journey and they may have you know certain obstacles that they have faced even just getting to school and just understanding that it's not as as it always seems so really just being more empathetic is very very important especially in the work that I do. How did it hold you back I guess that that kind of conditioning around being judgmental or, or judging people on face value? Um, I think it, it kind of put me into difficulty sometimes, especially in the, in the working in the field. When I started, you know, working like professionally in uh, office spaces, you know, I worked in the home, for the home office. But when I was a, a sports coach, I had to work in an office with other professionals. And it was then just understanding how to kind of interact and build the relations. And when you're quite judgmental and you have a lack of empathy, um, that can impact the relationships that you have and build in a, in a workspace. So it's very, very important to, to make sure that you're paying attention to that. 
Did it also kind of echo um, being judgmental of yourself, maybe? Because sometimes we project out what we feel inside, right? Like having less empathy, being a hard ass on ourselves yeah. and being like, I expect this from me, so therefore I expect that from everyone. Do you think it was like an internal thing as well? I don't know if you read a book about me or something. That's, I'm, <laughs> that's literally it. I'm really, really judgmental about myself and have been, you know, I've been extremely hard on myself at certain times when I, when I really shouldn't be, when things are, you know, quite positive, and it's just one thing that's maybe gone wrong in, in a day or in my year, or whatever it may be. But I can be very, very judgmental of myself and kind of not letting go of something where I made a mistake and maybe not learning from that mistake, but really holding myself back. And that's happened to me in, in very, various times at various points in my life. And I'm very, very hugely judgmental of myself, and I'm really critical of myself, and sometimes that holds me back. But I've really worked on that, um, especially since setting up Mentivity Team, which has helped me you know, as, as well as persevering, but also just being more open-minded, you know. I'm kind of, I'm a, I'm an optimist. I always have been. I always believe I can do something, even if it's not possible. And if people don't believe I can do it, that gives me added motivation. Oh, so Prove them wrong. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, yeah, that's what I would say. Prove them wrong. Uh, I love it. Um, tell us about Mentivity. What's it about? What's the aim for it? So, Mentivity really is this culmination of my life's experiences. Um, Coming from South East London, growing up in a council estate, you know, the typical stereotype, single parent household, dad left at eight and had my own troubles on my journey, you know, when, when he left. And for me, Mentivity is really just providing a service that was provided to me by really prominent men in the society um, and in my life. Um, as I spoke about Abdullah Ben Kamal, uh, most people will know him as Ben, who ran a football club for nearly 20 years. Um, Mr. Hansen, uh, Devin Hansen, who's uh, now retired, um, head of schools uh, for Arc Academy. Um, he's been someone I've known since the age of 11. And these guys have just been really prominent and always been there when I needed them and give me the advice and the support that I, I really needed. And as a young man, you know, navigating life in South East London is very difficult. And you know, there's a lot of young men that do not have their fathers around. So the work that we do is so important. So Mentivity is really trying to provide that support for young people who would need it, you know, an aspirational boost, uh, an emotional boost, someone that's gonna really give them the support to, to progress in life and raise their, their aspirations and hope. So we are a mentoring organization, an alternative educational provision. Um, we work with young people now from eight up to the age of 25. Um, we really focus on the informal education and conversation-based learning because we find that sharing stories, sharing experiences with young people helps them along their journey of life. And it also builds that rapport and gets them to understand how to build relations. And once they have that sort of foundation, then they understand you know, what the world is around them and who they are as a person, then it allows them to flourish and make the moves that they, they need to make. And without making kind of the, the kind of mistakes now, which young people now are really, it's difficult for them because they can make a mistake and they could lose their life. And we didn't have that when we were younger. You know, we could go to certain areas and you could live to fight another day. And young people now have got a different set of challenges. They have to be, in, in a sense, adults from a young age. So we're trying to give them that guided discovery, support them along their journey of life, and just get them to understand that if they really work on themselves and they follow their passions, they can get to where they want to get to in life. So really offering some role modeling that's, that you received in some cases, and I guess not in others, in order to provide that, that voice and guidance. Now, is it only, is it, is it male young people? Is it both? Is it ethnic minorities? Like what's the maybe criteria for working with you? So we're extremely inclusive in terms of our offer. Um, the name would allude to us just working with men, but it doesn't have anything to do with men. So it's actually okay. a play on words, so it's mentoring activity. So it. it came to me in a dream and, and that was a precursor to me finding a name and setting up mentivity. And yeah, I just thought it was quite catchy and went with it and it's really caught on since. So we work with young boys and girls uh, from all backgrounds, primarily in Southeast London. We are looking at black young boys and girls, you know, from African Caribbean backgrounds, because in education, there is a lot of obstacles they have to face on a daily basis and a lack of support in education. So we do focus primarily on that. However, we've done work down, we've got work down in Brighton and Worthing and Little to Hampton, we've done work in Eden Bridge in Kent. So our offer is very, very inclusive. And you're spreading out quite a quite a bit then as well. Um, so talk us through the, the, your thoughts around mental health. So you've compared a little bit like what it was like for you growing up versus what kids these days are experiencing. What are you seeing as far as the, the mental health conversation or the support people need for that specific topic? 
I think we're in, in the midst of a mental health crisis and have been for a long, a long time with young people. Because especially when you look from my background and growing up you know, from a Caribbean background, mental health wasn't something that was discussed. And it was never discussed. And, and that's, you know, the African diaspora across the world is something that we've had to just get on with. We've ne it's been a taboo subject. And I think that what we're seeing now, because of the advent of social media and the interactions and young people not being able to switch off from certain, you know, environments. When I was young, you could go to school. And if your bully was at school, or you had a negative experience. It stayed at school. And then it, it may be resumed the next day. And now you can't escape that. And young people now, I believe, are under attack, you know, from, from so many different uh, avenues and angles. And I think that we are in the midst of a mental health crisis. We really need to do a lot more work to prepare our young people to be able to deal and have coping mechanisms with regards to their mental health and, and well-being. And I just feel that mentivity is, is something now which is really delving into that mental health space and giving that support to young people because it's so important. And we have to have conversations. And if you're not readily available to have those conversations with young people, how are they going to learn? Because everybody's in their phones nowadays. Nobody talks, nobody communicates. So the art of talking and communicating and building relationships is pretty much lost. And by speaking and just listening to people, which is also very, very important, you know, active listening. You may not be able to assist, but just being there and being a shoulder to cry on or listen to will help people. And I think that because of the fast pace, you know, the manner of the world right now, we're missing that. And we're really kind of missing a, a trip with young people in terms of that. And we really need to spend as much time as we can in, in light of COVID now, you know, with children being at home and you've got to try and bridge that gap and really you know, discuss these things with young people, have those difficult conversations, be honest with your children and young people is so important. Such a good point about almost losing the art of conversation. And I think that's not only relevant for young people, but I see it in workplaces all the time. And, that, and it really some of the training that we do and the talks that we do, it's so simple. Like what you said is actually quite simple if you think about it, active listening, tell stories. I think you're also alluding to being open and vulnerable ourselves to almost model how you can have these conversations. Um, what about like your team and just from, from that perspective, so the mentors trying to support other people, what are the skills that they need? Are people open about their own mental health challenges from a work team perspective? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, Tyson and Leon are my directors. Tyson's actually my younger brother. Um, and we openly talk about our mental health because we are under immense pressure with what we're trying to do. And we also take on a lot uh, consciously and subconsciously in terms of young people's problems, but also parents and other people in the community and then uh, our families. So it's a lot. And we do have a real great coping mechanism where we will talk openly about our mental health and the support. I mean, I openly talk about going to counseling and therapy because there is so much trauma that I've experienced in certain avenues of my life um, in relation to so many different things. But again, it's not something that I've really practiced growing up and speaking about it and being a man, you know, everyone's like, you've got to be a man. You know, you fall over and it's like, okay, I'm crying. Like, it doesn't hurt. No, it does hurt. I'm crying. That's why, that's why I've got that emotion. So it's now just moving away from that and not trying to be that macho man who doesn't have any feelings. And because ultimately, if you don't let it out, it's going to start to consume you inside. So it's very, very important that we share those, those experiences of being vulnerable and being down and having struggles with our mental health and showcasing that to young people and openly talking about it because it shows them that, look, I can be vulnerable and they can look at us and be like, wow, well, if he can do that, then I can definitely speak about it. And it's really, really important that we showcase and model that to young people because it is so important. Like speaking, as you said, our conversation is, is dying, unfortunately. The art of listening is really dying. You know, people have a, a time span of a, a Snapchat, you know, 15 seconds or an Instagram video, 60 seconds. Use an emoji to capture your emotional experience, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> One image. That's it. <laughs> It's difficult. It really is difficult, but we're very, very, you know, open to that as, a, as an organization and speaking about it, especially as, you know, black men and black women that work for the, the, the organization and just showcasing that is so important. And, and a, another good point around um, when we're in a helping profession, so we are, perhaps we're in HR, we're in a people team, we're a youth worker, we're a therapist, we're whoever we might be, or just a friend who's listening to people who are struggling in a bigger way because of, of, of COVID and, and the, the mental health crisis, as you put it, it can sort of build up, can't it? it like, what are your tricks just to keep that, that is it a boundary in place? 
um, uh, so that other people's stuff doesn't affect you? Is it just talking? Is there is there anything else there just to, to prevent that overwhelm of holding other people's stuff? Yeah, I, I mean, last year and the year before, two difficult years for myself personally. Last year, I just literally burned out because I was doing way too much and being the head of an organization, you undertake so many other people's problems. Um, you know, looking over the finances, making sure people get paid, you lose a contract. Yeah, it's very, very stressful. And I'm always want to provide for people. I'm the oldest of seven. So that's kind of my role. And obviously being a father as well, of a 14 year old, it's just, that's in my, my, my makeup to be a provider and just make sure everybody else is okay. But what I haven't done um, consistently over the course of my life is put myself first at certain times. And, you know, last year I really burned out and that's when I really started to embrace the counselling and the therapy because there was a lot of things that I encountered as a young man um, and that I'd never really addressed and actually just pushed to the back of my mind. And it was important that I really started to kind of sit through, you know, all that trauma and really understand who I am and how it shaped the person I am today. And I wasn't actually happy with who I was. And I really needed to change those things. And it's, it's still ongoing. It's been difficult. Um, but, you know, I've lost... 10 young people in the last two years that I've worked extensively with, with and the most notable would be Raheem Barton, who I'd known since the age of eight. And when he was shot and killed um, on the 5th of May, 2018, that one really, really hurt me because I'd known him for so long. I went to school with his mum and it was just, I really just tried to deflect and, and continue on my journey, but I couldn't sleep. I was reenacting what happened in his dreams. I was actually with him on the day that he, he was killed oh. uh, on the morning. So he was actually working for us. Um, we have a football club as well um, in a city called City of London FC. And he was learning how to be a coach and it was a precursor for him to start working with mentality. And he had some, you know, well documented issues that he was trying to overcome and, you know, just trying to navigate life as a young person. So when, when I lost Raheem, it just felt like I lost my own son. And um, there's no way really to deal with that kind of grief and loss. And I've lost people, um, you know, I've lost grandparents and people. But this one really, really hurt because he was only 17 and it was just... And changing his life. It sounds like he was trying to put the work in to get out well, of that lifestyle. Yeah, he, he, he was. And we, that, it, what was so ironic was on the day he actually said, you know what, thank you, Sace, Tyson, Leon, thank you guys, because now I, f I can see it now. I can see, like, I've been oh. wasting my time, wasting my life. And he knew, he, there was something, he had a special energy, but Raheem knew, um, and he knew that potentially something was going to happen because we always used to tell him, like, Raheem, love you, man. And he'd be like, what's wrong with you, man? Like, <laughs> like are you like men or something? I'm like, no, I'm just telling you because you don't hear this, you know? And on the day, he actually said, you know what, Say, Tyson, Leon, I love you guys, man. Like, I really love you, and I really appreciate you. And that was the last interaction I had with him. Um, and it's also the best interaction of uh, course. because it was so positive and, you know, losing him on that day was just, it was hard to take. And I just didn't really pay attention to it. I've never, there's no manual for how to deal with grief and loss and, um, you know, waking up and having nightmares and kind of like sleepwalking and things like that. Like just things are, that people won't know that I kind of encountered and had to go through. So I really need to get some help. And by not paying attention to that, things around me in my life started to kind of capitulate. And so I really, I've learned a valuable lesson in terms of that and really putting yourself first and, you know, making sure I'm working out and like now really just embracing yoga and meditation, um, which is okay. fantastic. Um, just making sure I do it because it just sets me up, you know, for the day. Do you have a, does it inform like a morning routine? Is that part of, is that what you try and do? Have a, have a discipline around that? Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying my best right now. I'm doing three times a week at the moment, uh, just at home. Um, trying to progress it to every day, um, but you know, trying to make things a habit. And you know, it's it's, tough. I know it's so tough. You, see, you know, it's a habit. And getting up early, trying to get up at six a.m. every day, and just making sure I do it. It is tough, but I'm gonna. I'm determined to make it happen because I know it's gonna benefit me in the long run. So, it's just yeah, it's very, very, it's very hard. And I'm learning a lot about myself, you know, through the counseling. It's it's very, very important, and I'm I'm really just embracing it. So take us back again, um, just to, you know, what's formed your, your own passion and you've alluded to, you know, single parent family, uh, council estate, South London. So, so some of that being your, your own experience, but I can tell that everything about mentality mentivity is, is heart focused. You're here. It's very purpose driven. You're doing it so you can give other people perhaps what you didn't have and just heartbreaking, uh, to, uh, to hear about losing, uh, Raheem and, and of course, um, the others. 
Um, but just give us a flavor of why is this your passion specifically? So talk to us about, talk to us about your mental health. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, I just feel that mental health is always an ongoing you know, challenge and ongoing journey. And by embracing that, and, and even with my peers and speaking with my friends, it wasn't something that we spoke about, you know, as men. You know, we'd always have put on this bravado, like everything was okay, and yeah, I'm going to go play football, I'll just go oh, to the pub, have a drink. I'll punch someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was something when I was young, which, you know, I, I really enjoyed fighting when I was young, and that was the way that we sold things. Um, it wasn't through talking. It was like, okay, I've got a, a beef with you. All right, cool, we're going to fight. And that's how it was. And that was the kind of masculine kind of thing to do. Um, but it was also difficult, you know, growing up as a kid on the council estate and going to the school that I went to in South East London, which was Kingsdale which was a very tough school at the time. And you had to be tough. If you were vulnerable, people were going to take, you know, liberties with you. They were going to literally target you. So yeah. you really had to just focus on putting on this kind of, kind of bravado. and To survive. Yeah, that's pretty much that's what it was. So it's so important to me because I, my, my son is 14 and I've got a showcase to him that I can be vulnerable, that I am paying attention to my mental health. And I talk to him openly about it. He knows that I go to counseling, he knows that. And it's not a negative thing, it's something that we talk about positively. And the thing is, when you talk about counseling therapy and you say it to people, they look at you like you're broken, you're damaged goods, but we're all damaged goods. We all got our own issues. We're human, yeah. Yeah, we've got our own problems, so no one's perfect. So it's just, with mentivity, it's just, it's my passion. My passion to help people comes from my mom. You know, my mom has got the biggest heart ever. She has done everything, you know, in terms of raising seven children, always there to listen to, to people's problems and sort other people's problems out and help them. And that's something that I've learned. And we come from a family of educators as well. And it's, it's our passion to educate and really help people on their journey of life. And I'm just, this doesn't feel like work to me. It, it, I get up every day and I feel, right, what's the next challenge? What's going on? Like, who am I going to speak to? And working with young people is probably the best thing. It actually helps my mental health because it's refreshing. You know, you sometimes you're having a, a bad day and you go into a classroom to do a session. You're like, oh, kind of want to go home and then you just get that that love and light from young people and that spot and it keeps me young to be honest it really keeps me young and I love working with young people and, and bringing that you know to the, the wider you know, community and, and showing people that those young people have a massive part to play and we're not actually focusing on them and giving them the, the, the tools to feel empowered to make the changes that they want to see and think more critically and it's so important so yeah it's just my passion and i will do this until the day i die you know if i can and mentivity for me is going to be a legacy around you know mental health and well-being but also support and progression and really educating yourself and following your passions it's just so key oh this is all just reminds me of like back when i was doing youth work and you just get this truth don't you um which is a little bit different than 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 corp the corporate sector like i'll bring the truth and you'll have like one or two people it's like you lose your bravery when you grow up yeah and you're yeah. like oh let me just hide behind this suit yeah just be really careful whereas kids it's so refreshing i i, I just love the fact that they're just like you're shit today. <laughs> like, they'll, even, they'll actually tell you. And I'm like, that's fair. All right, let's talk about that. <laughs> you know, at least, at least you know where you stand, right? You're so heartbroken. Like, oh, God. Yeah. But it does keep you on your toes. You're right. And that is so key. Is, and that's what I love about young people in terms of being competitive and just showcasing certain things and traits that we sometimes lose as adults. It's so great to see. And it's, it's about, you know, being able to shape and, and mold young people in a positive way, but in collaboration, not from your adult agenda saying, look, this is from my perspective and saying, look, that's great, but you could be greater. You could be better. And this is what happened. And they were like, you know what? I respect that still. I'm, I'm going to do that. Nurture the fire. I, yeah, I love it. I love Nurture it. the fire. But also, I, I think you'll probably have this experience. Some, and, and I've had it personally when I was a young person. There's certain people that influence me that still probably to this day don't know that they did, you know? So there's yeah. the kid who's still pushing back and like, you know, saying, you know, why are you saying you love me? Ugh. You know, all of that. <laughs> and, but you don't know the, the impact, right? Over time of, the, of that person uh, experiencing this. Oh, anyway, I'm going to do some work with mentivity because I just, yeah. I've got to get back involved. Oh, um, oh, I'm oh. like feeling alive. <laughs> but it's also great to love what you do. I did a post on Instagram the other day because I just took a week off. And, and usually people come to the end of their holiday and they're like, oh God, yeah. and I was like all bubbly and jumpy going, I'm getting back. I'm so excited, <laughs> which is, which is cool. Yeah. Um, 
So let's let's um, think about the future a little bit. So 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 kids are the future of work. They're going to be our workforce. They're the people, you know. And and you 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 very um, eloquently talk about the mental health crisis that young people are experiencing due to lack of conversation, social media, and of course we, the demographic that you work with have have other challenges within within uh, their surroundings as well. Not to mention, I think everyone can relate to the cultural piece. Whatever your conditioning, you know, I'm not from an ethnic minority, but I grew up in a cult and I'm in a blended family and I've got a whole experience um, that conditions me to be a certain way. What do you think we need to give our young people or how do we need to listen to them? Or what do you see as the future of work given COVID, given, you know, how fast the world is changing? Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very complex, you know, question really, if you think about it in depth, because now the uncertainty we have around COVID is not allowing people to actually plan for next month. No. <laughs> or let alone next year or five years down the line. And again, linking that to the mental crisis that we're having, especially with young people, is saying, right, well, I can't actually think about becoming maybe a professional football player or becoming a barrister or doing this because I don't know whether I'm going to be able to do these things. But again, it's about educating young people to be, you know, uh, persevere and to be hopeful that they can do things linked to their passion is so, so important. And for us, what we've embarked on with is this, um, the Raising Aspirations project with Goldman Sachs, which is basically getting young people uh, to mix with volunteers from Goldman Sachs with us facilitating the sessions and actually speaking about the work-life balance and how you're going to progress towards your career, listen to the stories of the Goldman Sachs volunteers and saying, right, well, you came from California and you're doing this and now you're living in London and you used to live here. Like, I love your story. But it's actually now getting them to re really think about their careers linked to their passions and saying, look, if I want to be an accountant, I could do this at Goldman Sachs. And that's what the Raising Aspirations Project is about, is actually allowing young people to dream and link it to their passions. Because what we find in education is that People in education, you know, teachers are telling young people, oh, you could be an academic or you could do this, but that's based on their view. They don't know these young people because they're not taking the time to, to converse and speak to the young people. And that's the difference with us is saying, look, what are you passionate about? You know, a young person may be passionate about football, but they're not training and they're not playing for a team, but they could be a physiotherapist. They could be a data analyst. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very, very important to link young people's careers to their passions. And that's something that we're doing with the Raising Aspirations Project at Goldman Sachs, um, which is a really groundbreaking project, which we had to deliver online because of COVID. Uh, we've done delivered two iterations of it. Uh, are, kids, are kids showing up to that? I'm curious about the online, do they just on their phones and they're... No, they're engaged because the way that we, we post it is really, so it's four and a half hours a week, so an hour and a half session. Um, one session is based around something that we're really focused on because it, it could be mastery, it could be around accountability and relationship building. And the second session, again, will be more about sharing stories. So some of the facilitators will share their stories and talk about their journey. For example, me, I'll talk about my journey from a council of state, playing professional football in the Republic of Ireland, uh, finding coaching, getting injured, getting an offer to Howard University that falling through. So just, tell, you know, telling my, my journey and story and the kids are engaged. And then on Fridays, the Goldman Sachs staff then share their stories. So it's actually just sharing experience and having lots of conversation and a few games thrown in as well. And the first uh, cohort, we had 25 young people. We had 112 sign up, but at core 25, that stayed the course, which was fantastic. And for the first pilot, which was amazing. And the second one, we had about 15 to 20. Um, and that was during the summer holidays. And that was when lockdown was easing so we can engage young people and we base it around what they need and uh, again we may have a, a plan but again they might be like no we want to discuss this we want to discuss black lives matter we want to discuss something else and we're like cool let's have a debate have our breakout room so again you've got to be flexible and adaptable with young people but i think for us it's about now creating viable visible opportunities into organizations such as Goldman Sachs for young people and tracking their progress from as young as nine, 10, so that we're focusing them in education to work towards that, that, that career goal. And that's so important because you're not having people guiding them along that journey in schools. It's all about formal outcomes or your GCSEs. Most people get these GCSEs and they never use them again in their life. You know, and we put so much pressure on young people, again, linking it to mental health. 
you know, with the fast that we had with the GCSEs and the A levels, like it's it's comical. And we've got adults messing things up all the time and then blaming the children because they messed it up. And then yeah. what does that do to the psyche of young people? So it's important that we have this embedded service and keep focusing young people based around their passions because you don't want to get up, you know, at the age of 35 and be like, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, oh, I've got to I do it. I see this. it all the time. Right, right. I see it all the time. And, and even people who went down the right path, GCSEs, A-levels, whatever, they followed the rules, whatever, and then 35, they're coming to me as a coach or a therapist and they're going, I want to kill myself. Yeah. They're yeah. like, I'm that dissatisfied. It's that, it's that bad. And this is what the problem is, that everyone has a part to play within society. Not everyone's going to get to where they want to get to, but if you link it to your passions, it's not really going to feel like work on some days. There are some days it's going to be hard, but that's when the passion will get you through. You know, when I was wanting to play professional football, getting up at six to go and train or make a, a way to, to you know, a game in three hours, four hours away, I would do it because I was passionate about it. If it was linked to some other sport or something else, I wouldn't have done it. And football has been the precursor to me being able to progress in life because then I found out I liked coaching young people and liked working with young people. So then went into education. And that's why- but Wait, was there like a dark point in the middle of like this football athlete trajectory to kind of needing, I think you said you were, you were injured or needing to adapt your trajectory from where you thought you were going. What was that? Was there a turning point there? There were several. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I left England to go to the Republic of Ireland to play professional football for about a year and a half on and off. And that was a great experience, you know, leaving home and living with other boys from London in the Republic of Ireland was a great experience. Um, and then my contract came to an end, came back, went to Romania, didn't work out there. And I came back and I got injured. So I broke and dislocated my ankle. And at that time, I was supposed to go to Howard University. So I couldn't go. And literally, that just kind of shattered my whole... Yeah. ...in terms of football, getting a free education, moving to another country again. And that's when I really started working on myself and you know, young people. And it was, it was hard because I kind of regressed and started hanging around the people that I, I hung around when I was younger. Yeah. Positive. And you just kind of revert to type, don't you? And... Um, it was again, football coaching that got me through. And I realized, oh, I'm actually good at football coaching. I can analyze the game. I can support young people. So my qualifications and got my, my, my certificates in coaching. And I just really just focused on coaching. And that's what changed my trajectory. And then from being someone that played professionally and then having the heartbreak of being injured and not going following my dreams, I then actually funneled my energy into coaching, my passion to coaching more so than playing. And that's, you know, helping so many young people along the journey. I've helped about 10 to 20 young people play, you know, professional football and move on. You know, one of the most notable is Jaden Sancho, who plays for Borussia Dortmund. He's, you know, he's a superstar. And I've helped coach him for about four years and Reese Nelson of Arsenal. So, again, I had to change that because it was, it was really dark days. You know, I couldn't play football. I was living... It feels hopeless, right? When you think you were going a certain way and then you just, and, and you talked earlier about the, the judgment on yourself and you being your own harshest critic. So yeah. I imagine it's not only the physical that needs to be healed and all of that, but it's the mind game, isn't it? Of like, yeah. you, you failed, you, you, you suck, like what, whatever the, the, the worst voices are in your head. Yeah, I mean, it took me, gosh, it took me the best part of 12 to 14 years to get over not playing professional football. Wow. It took me a long time. Um, I had a lot. I think people really need to hear that, that because I experienced that as well as like you have these pivotal change moments and then people think, oh, there's something about you that's just strong and you switched it up overnight. It's not overnight. It's putting in the work and moving forward, even though your head is still sort of attacking you, isn't it? Yeah, and it was constant. And that was me just being so hard on myself and really, you know, suffering depression through that and getting through that injury, which is... 10 months out of the game and getting back and doing really well and then getting injured again and no. did my knee, my meniscus. And then a month after that, I had a, a kidney disorder called nephrotic syndrome, which is something that you can, you can die from. Um, Jonah Lomu had complications with nephrotic syndrome and that was one of the reasons he passed away. So normally you only have it when you're very young or very old. And I found myself on the ward Christmas Eve, 2005, being told that it was lucky I got here. You know, I could have potentially died. And, you know, prior to that as well, I had an incident where I, I nearly lost my life as well. So I was struggling with PTSD and not knowing what it was and tried to engage in therapy, but I was 
this young man who thought that he was indestructible, you know, so I just continued on. And it took me a long while to get over not being able to play professional football. I didn't probably let go of the dream probably until the, about 30, 31. And it was very, very hard, um, you know, just not being able to play football because that was my therapy. That was what allowed me to get all of my emotions out, my anger out and feel great when I came off the pitch. So not being able to play for two years between 2005 and 2000, or nearly three years, 2008, it was a struggle. It's I, like you don't know where all of that should go. And yeah. it goes back into violence or your conditioned thinking or in, it builds up on the inside, doesn't it? Yeah, it really, it was really horrible. It was really dark times. And even looking back on it, just thinking about depression, like I didn't even realize I was depressed until, you know, recently. And it was something that you just thought, well, this is how it is. You know, no one was there to talk to me about this. And I didn't have anyone that could really talk to about it. So I really struggled with that. And it was just using that kind of disappointment and that frustration and anger um, and really funneling it into coaching. And that's where, I, you know, I really excelled and really just found my, my niche, you know, and then youth work and work with young people. And that's where the, the burning desire, you know, came from so much. So it's so important to me. I feel like we could talk all day. Um, I just, I just want to hang out with you uh, and just get to know you more. This is, um, it's so great to hear about your journey. Um, just thinking again about the workplace, what do you think employers need to know when hiring one of your kids or, or, or kind of supporting them through getting into the workplace, those routines, that discipline, like how can they be inclusive and support effectively so they can be their best selves? It's really about having an open mind and, and really with Goldman Sachs, what we're doing is really trying to showcase and train the staff up to be ready to receive young people. And I think that's so important. It's because as adults, we seem to forget that we were once children and forget the things that we did and the mistakes that we made, which actually led us to being where we are today. And I think this is so important to really tap into your childhood as much as you can. Uh, when you're dealing with young people and when you're trying to you know engage them it's so so important and just understanding that they're going to make mistakes and you know we call it guided discovery that we stand back you walk you fo I follow your lead and when you fall okay cool there we go I'll support you and that's what it's about it's not about being on, on young people's case all the time if you see potential in someone and you've got the relationship and you can push them great but a relationship underpins everything that's going to happen going forwards. If you don't have that relationship with young people, they're not going to, to progress. And it has to be, you know, the voluntary engagement between mentor and mentee in that, in that field. And you've really got to understand that. And that's why I think mentoring has such a massive part to play within society and within the world, uh, because it's, it underpins everything that we do in society and the world. And you have to learn from somebody else who's more experienced and take that experience and make it your own. And that's what's important, that you are not trying to create someone who's going to be you. You're trying to create someone that's going to be unique and progressive in their way. And that's what's so important. Um, and I think workplaces really need to have more young people shaping their, their policies and how they engage. And because they have um, great ideas. It's just about honing those ideas and supporting that, that kind of train of thought and that critical thinking because they have massive contributions. And if we don't get them thinking critically from a young age and empowering them to do so, then we're going to miss out on a generation of people that could contribute great things to this world. And also businesses are going to suffer and fail in these times where we have to be adaptable and the ones that survive are the ones that um, have that adaptability, that fresh thinking, that sort of thing. Yeah. Not listening to our young people can be detrimental. Uh, yeah. So many great tips there just about, um, I love that, like let them fail because I got two kids as well, 16 yeah. and 14. So it's yeah. certainly like, oh, what can we learn from that? Like provide them some guidance around critical thinking, but let them do the stuff uh, and be there for them when, when they're ready for you to come back. Um, Sais, thank you so much. Um, you talked a little bit just around, I just want to end on this, your, your, your own mental health and your own non-negotiables, I guess, now. I heard exercise, um, meditation, uh, some, some yoga in there. Do you have any other non-negotiables or things that you try and incorporate, even if it's not perfectly, uh, to look after yourself now and sustain your own mental health? Yeah, I mean, normally it would have been travel. Oh, <laughs> so, what? <laughs> you got to replace it. I know, I know. I, I mean, I'm lucky that I've, I'm quite well traveled. You know, I've been to like, in excess of 35 countries. Like, I, I love to travel, and that was something that kind of just replenished me and allowed me to to incorporate 
you know, new cultures, you know, I'm really in love with Kenya at the moment. Um, oh, I love Kenya. I lived in Mombasa for about a year. Oh, I love Kenya. Oh. We've, got, we've, got, we've, got, we've got projects there for Mentivity and in Uganda, so we'll Amazing. hope to we'll get back there soon. But I just think it's about, about being adaptable um, for me. It's now shaping, because of this new normal, it's about shaping your new normal and, and being able to kind of facilitate your growth in that way and just being open and receptive to try new things. I never would have tried meditation before. However, I know now that it's something I'm going to do for the rest of my life because it, it allows me to be in tune with myself. So I think it's very, very important to really focus on yourself during these times and be, don't be afraid to tell people, I don't want to talk today. I don't want to respond to a message. Or you don't even have to. You know, that pressure, because everyone wants that instant kind of gratification, that instant response. Like, I don't have to respond to you. So, again... What <laughs> are you even saying right now? <laughs> I don't need to respond to you? I don't have so to. you mean you can have autonomy and choice yeah, I think about how you live your life? Yeah, because, because we're in these times where a lot of people are working from home, you're sitting in front of the screen for 12 hours a day where you wouldn't do that at work. Then you're on your phone catching up with people and sending text messages. I would say pick up the phone, which is better. Just talk, yeah, talk, 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 better. yeah. But again, just don't be afraid to take that time out for yourself and just really just focus on yourself. Be selfish at certain times. It's, it, it's going to be key in these times. I love it. Says, thank you so much. We're going to have to have you on again and go further into your story. I think you're going to be a regular on the <laughs> podcast. Uh, but for now, thank you so much. Where can people find Mentivity? Is it just mentivity.org or com? So www.mentivity.com. We're also on Instagram at Mentivity and Twitter. Um, yeah, if you want to learn more, just, yeah. Lovely. Follow, donate, get involved, people. It sounds amazing. Says, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Petra.